A warm welcome to the Evolution Show. I'm Johan Landgren. I hope you're great. In the previous episode, I talked with Arthur Berman about the start of what I call the perfect energy storm, as the world production of natural gas is about to peak and decline over the next couple of years, and why this means more than just much higher energy prices. Today, Berman is back to explain how he's observing the same phenomenon for the world oil production, and why this cannot be solved with just adding more renewable energy. Join us for an important conversation on why the energy world as we know it is about to change dramatically. I hope you appreciate the conversation as much as I did. If you do, feel free to give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to support the show. Okay, let's get going. This is the Evolution Show. Uh, welcome back, uh, Arthur Berman, to part two of our conversation. Pleasure, Johan. Good to be here. Yeah, and today, uh, Art Berman, he's back on the Evolution Show to explain why the U.S. largest oil producer, U.S. the world's oil, largest oil producer, uh, is likely to start declining within maybe a few years already. And uh, in the previous episode, we talked about the shale gas production and how uh, that will impact the energy and the energy market and the, uh, uh, the economy. And uh, Art explained and, um, how important this uh, production has been uh, in over the last decade. But now we're moving on to the oil sector. Uh, so I thought we could start by looking at an overview, overview um, of the oil, US oil production. Uh, so people can get an idea of the importance of the US shale oil production and what makes it different to conventional oil and offshore oil production, for example. And uh, yeah. So that, 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 that's a great place to start, Johan, and, and, and thank you for that. So there's a slide um, that, that your viewers can, can see <clears throat> that shows um, uh, world production since about 2005 or 2006. And in this slide, I'm showing conventional oil, which is green. On top of that, I've laid down deep water and oil sands in yellow and on top of that tight oil and 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 the details of the slide are, are 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 not important what is important is that is that that green conventional oil is for the most part absolutely flat for the entire period of, of this graph so um the supply of conventional oil has neither increased nor particularly decreased except briefly during the 2020 COVID pandemic. And, and we, we added a layer of mostly offshore uh, production, which raised the overall level um, of supply. But again, that's been absolutely flat for, uh, you know, for nearly the past 20 years. And so it's the blue, the layer on top, which is tight oil or shale oil, that is all of the growth. All of the growth in global oil supply has come from this. And I don't know exactly the percent, but I want to say at least 95% of it is all from the United States. Some of it's from Canada, a little bit of it's from Argentina. And so the world population keeps increasing. The world energy consumption keeps increasing. And what this graph shows is that most of that increase, at least on the liquid side of, of supply, has come from U.S. shale oil or tight oil. And, and it's as simple as that. And so if, as you said in your introduction, um, U.S. supply of that shale oil is going to peak and decline sometime in the next several years, and I have very strong evidence to suggest that it will, then that means that the whole world is in trouble for its supply growth. And if supply growth is a problem, then uh, that means that prices will get higher, which will have an effect, a negative effect on economic growth. So it's as simple as that. Yeah. 
And you have another graph showing the different shale plays in the US. So maybe you can, we can look at that and talk about the difference between conventional oil and tight oil or shale oil. Why that distinction is so important to understand when we look ahead. Right. So, so the, the, the US, um, you know, our production profile looks somewhat similar to the world in that uh, our conventional supply has been pretty much flat for, well, it declined a lot actually from about 1970 until the early 2000s. The US used to produce, you know, like maybe 10 million barrels a day in the early 1970s. <clears throat> And by 2005, 2006, we were down to maybe 4 million barrels a day. So that's, that's huge. <laughs> and the way that, that that was compensated for was the U.S. became the world's largest importer. So we're spending a lot of money uh, bringing other people's oil into the United States. And so, again, we, you know, we, started, uh, we started with this tight oil. And there's, there's sort of two categories on this chart that I show. One is tight oil in general, and then tight oil from the Permian Basin in particular, which is the big one, um, you know, the, the largest single supply of, of tight oil and you know, just about any new oil in the world. And so the U.S. and therefore the world is hugely dependent on, on these tight oil and particularly the Permian Basin tight oil play. Yeah. And you, you also uh, have another graph I thought was very interesting where you look at, uh, you have a US tight oil that has accounted for as US shale oil uh, for basically all the growth since 2010. I think it's also very illustrative. Um, you see on the top there of the graph, you see in the blue, the tight oil, uh, but the conventional oil has basically been flat uh, so, so, right. so it's filled out kind of the, the, the demand. Um, tight oil has supplied the demand uh, uh, that has not been able to come from the conventional oil, right? Correct. Yeah. And, and, they're, and they're really, I mean, there are some people here in my country who, who have a, um, I, what I believe is a mistaken view that, you know, if only the government um, would uh, lift a lot of its regulations and restrictions that, somehow you know this conventional oil production would would greatly increase and and um i i wish that were true but it, it's just not i mean we the united states has uh is a very mature petroleum province and and most of the big oil companies stopped exploring for conventional oil in the united states back in the 1980s or so and went elsewhere mostly to other countries so you know the the, the possibility of uh of new supply just by changing government policies, I think is is uh, is is an unrealistic dream. Yeah. So that's what what must basically was my follow up question. I mean, can you throw more money at this and, and then you know solve the problem, or is it basically a, a geological problem? Uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's it's fundamentally a geological problem. I mean, you can always throw more money at a at a geological problem you can drill twice as many uh wells that are uh performing more poorly than than the wells that you drilled a year or two or three ago and if you have infinite money and and your business doesn't have to make a profit um for a little while you can uh you can you, you can delude yourself into thinking there is no problem but eventually these things always uh come back to uh you know, to affect us in, 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 in negative ways. So throwing money at it is, um, you know, kind of a, maybe a short term fix. It's not a solution. The problem ultimately is geological. Yeah. And you have a really good description explaining this, that what we've seen the last decade and what, what I didn't expect when I looked at this 10 years ago was that you have been able in US to increase uh, the shale oil production significantly, but you have explained that this has not to do with a bigger field or bigger play being discovered, but adding a bigger straw so you can basically suck up or produce more uh, faster than you did before. And that is obviously a technology adjustment and you know the field and the industry may, may be becoming more mature to this technology. Is that a fair assessment? It is a fair assessment, and I want to make a, a an important point that I don't think some people understand, and that is 
no energy is created from technology. Technology is, as you correctly said, it, it's a straw. It, it's a way of accelerating the the access to energy that we already know about. And I'm not just talking about oil. I'm not just talking about uh, natural gas or coal. I'm, I'm talking about all energy that, you know, talk about the sun or the wind um, or, you know, or, or, or water. Um, the resource is known. The resource doesn't change or it doesn't change very much. It's our ability to access it in an efficient and commercial way that's what the technology does so we build you know more effective solar panels um, that can convert the sun's energy faster or more cheaply than than previous or we drill horizontal wells and and use hydraulic fracturing in the case of tight oil or shale oil um, to access what's been known and I mean, as we already discussed in the previous segment, uh, these shale uh, resources are are not new. Um, it's not like we woke up one one morning in you know in two thousand five and said, "Hey, I just discovered a new a new thing." <laughs> I mean, oil companies have known that these that that these resources have existed for 50 years they've been evaluating them for 50 years but oil prices were not high enough until the the scare of supply that peak oil resulted in in the early 2000s oil prices weren't high enough for markets to allocate capital to develop or optimize the technology to get this oil out of the ground. So, um, and and where we are today, Johan, is um, we we've reached a level of maturity in those new plays, uh, just like any other supply um, of anything, but particularly energy. Um, we increase production dramatically, and now we're peaking. <laughs> And there will come a time in the not too distant future where um, that supply will begin to decline. And, and there's this common idea that, oh, well, that's just the United States. I mean, there's shale everywhere in the world. I mean, we can we should be able to do this miracle that the United States has done. Now, again, uh, this is without considering climate uh, emissions kinds of concerns, but you know, in a in a, in an emission free world, we should be able to reproduce the same phenomenon wherever there's shale in the world, and that that's you know that, that's a very nice idea, but it, it doesn't work that way. And so, what we've learned, and this is purely empirical, it's not theoretical or anything, is that only certain kinds of shale um, work for this kind of of production. And not only a certain kind of shale, but at a certain depth and at a certain state of geological maturity. And when you lay all those factors on top of each other, what we find is that indeed North America is a, is a fairly anomalous place with respect to all of those factors combining to make the shale production possible. And as I survey the world and look at where else might this be possible? realistically i see very very few opportunities there there's a an area in russia uh called the bashanov shale that has some potential uh it hasn't resulted in anything commercial yet but it should work um there's the vaca muerte in in argentina which is being actively developed and then there are um deposits of source rocks basically in the middle east um, which ought to have this potential. Beyond that, um, you know, there, there are little bits and pieces here and there. But unfortunately, you know, uh, geology doesn't work according to human expectations. Then we factor in that, you know, that people in, a, in, in, in population-dense areas, say like Europe, you know, they, 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 don't, they don't want oil and gas drilling in their backyard or uh they don't own the mineral rights they they don't profit from 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 the drilling so so then there are social and economic factors that we lay on top of it and the result is is that this opportunity 
it does exist elsewhere in the world. It's it's more limited than most people think. Yeah. And then, of course, the follow up question is, uh, when can we expect this kind of decline? And also, what kind of decline rate would you guess that you, you estimate that we will see in the first couple of years from a decline in the US? So, so that's, as you know, that's a very difficult question to answer. But my sense is that um, we, we, I, I fully expect that we will see uh, declining shale oil production, certainly this decade, uh, and probably quite a bit sooner. I would say, uh, realistically, within two or three years, I think the world will be um, very aware of, of, of the problem that it doesn't think that we have right now. So, you know, 2026, 2025, 2027, I don't know exactly when it will be. Uh, as you said, we can throw some money at it uh, and maybe postpone the inevitable, but um, it, it's going to be a factor sooner than later, and it will be this decade. I'm quite certain of that. Yeah, and that, and that as you said, um it's not just U.S. because U.S. has been the biggest producer. So U.S. Mm -hmm. declining means that there is, as I understand it, there are no short term replacement or alternatives in terms of other production coming online. Let's say we have two or three million barrels coming in from, you know, um, uh, Iran or Saudi Arabia and so on. And OPEC, of course, the OPEC countries together. But mm -hmm. uh, with the decline rate of, I don't know, two or three million or beyond that per year, uh, there is no short term alternative to the US shale oil. Is that correct? That, that is unfortunately correct. And so, for instance, Saudi Arabia has announced um, two or three what seem like important discoveries um, over the last year or two. And uh, these are you know, we, we don't know the details, but uh, the public information is, I mean, wells that are producing, you know, potentially two, three, four thousand barrels a day and, uh, you know, many, many uh, uh, billion cubic feet of, uh, of gas. But what what's interesting about them is that these appear to be unconventional fields. These are not uh, these are not Gawar kind of fields in Saudi Arabia. These are basically tight oil and, and and shale gas which is great you know that's why i said there are there are unconventional possibilities elsewhere in the world but i think that <clears throat> that the conventional oil supply for the world is more or less flat into the near term there's another aspect to all this that i i i doubt that people are tremendously aware of and and, and that is that an awful lot of what we call oil in the world is actually something called natural gas liquids. Okay. And so there's a slide that, that shows that, you know, that, that something uh, looking at, at the, at, at world liquid supply, you know, that something like 20% of what we call oil is actually natural gas liquids. What are natural gas liquids? They're things like ethane and propane and butane. These are liquids that are, processed out of natural gas so they're they they come to the surface as a gas um and we send them to a, a processing plant where through various chemical and catalytic processes we we force uh the ethane and the methane and the propane i'm sorry not the methane the the ethane and the propane and the butane uh into a liquid form and 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 these are these are mostly used. Ethane is used for plastics mostly. It's also can be burned like methane. Propane, I think you you know you mentioned that in you know rural areas in Sweden, a lot of people heat their homes with propane that they keep in tanks outside. Butane is a flammable liquid that's you know used in cigarette lighters and and things like that. But none of those are particularly useful as transport fuels, okay? I mean, there, there, there are a few exceptions, uh, technology exceptions, but for the most part, they're not useful, but they're counted as oil. So 20% roughly of oil in the world isn't oil. And an awful lot of that comes from the United States. The United States exports about 4 million barrels of crude oil and condensate a day. We also export about 
almost 3 million barrels a day of these natural gas liquids. So the United States is contributing something like 7 million barrels a day of what's called oil to the world. And, 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 and what I'm showing you is that I think that that supply is going to decrease. That's, you know, that's a tremendous proportion of, I mean, the world uses, let's say, 101, 102 million barrels a day. So the United States contribution, the export contribution is like 6%, 5%. And, and we've discussed earlier in another uh, discussion that just a few percent or even a fraction of a percent of change in supply can make a tremendous difference in price for the average person like you or me when we go to put uh, gasoline or diesel in our car or have to pay for our, you know, our, our home heating or whatever. So these are problems that perhaps they originate in the United States, but they affect everybody in the world that uses energy. And, and, and that doesn't, you know, Sweden and, and, and Northern Europe, uh, they, they don't get a pass on that. It, you know, we live in a connected world. Yeah, uh, just a correction. We're, you don't use propane gas in Sweden, but I was referring to, to the US and other, and other countries in Europe. Okay. But it doesn't matter. Yeah. I just, just for people, so people don't come up with it and say, oh, you are, you're wrong about this. Okay, <laughs> okay. But it doesn't matter. But another point you make, um, you had a graph also showing the US uh, tight, you know, the proportion of natural gas, ethanol, and, and so on, and that it's actually even 42%, up to 42% that comes from natural gas. And that kind of is included in the overall total oil production, which is confusing, yes, is. confusing, I think, for people. So you can maybe just mention or go through this graph a little bit. Right. So this graph shows U.S. conventional oil in dark blue kind of at the bottom. And what we see is that it's, it, it's sort of declining or a little bit flat. There's the wedge of increasing tight oil on top of that. And then everything that's in sort of the hot colors of orange or yellow, those are all liquids that come from other places, mostly natural gas. Okay. It's all include, it's called oil, but the, the largest percentage of it is natural gas liquids but we added up there's something called refinery gain refinery gain we put a barrel of oil into a refinery we we refine it into gasoline and diesel and all of it you know jet fuel and and those those products have a lower density than the oil that comes in so there's a volumetric increase um because of the fact that we're refining it. And that volumetric increase is, you know, like a million, a million and a half barrels a day. That's counted as 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 oil production or oil supply. The natural gas liquids, as I say, they don't even come from from petroleum. Those come from natural gas. Um, those are they they come to the surface as a gas. They're taken to a plant and they're 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 stripped is what we call them we introduce chemicals and other things to force them into a liquid and and then there you know there's there's fuel ethanol <clears throat> in the united states at least we add this fuel ethanol to our gasoline well you know that comes from plants <laughs> mostly you know corn and, and 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 other things so that that's not even natural gas so this giant wedge of you know as you said 42% of us liquids production has nothing whatsoever to do with crude oil or condensate. It's, it's a whole different category. And that doesn't mean we should discount it or say it's, you know, it's, it's a mistake. No, it's, it's, it's not that it's just that the average person doesn't, doesn't understand. And you can't, you can't use all of this 42% in the same way that you can, you know, the other 58%, you can't put this, you know these natural gas liquids or refinery gain in in your in your your diesel truck you know you can't you can't power a, a you know a train or a subway or a ship with it so um it's useful 
but it's used for different things. Yeah, I think that was a really important point. Kind of, I think in the back of the mind of people, I think they think that maybe, yeah, listen to this and you have a decline in the oil production, in the shale oil production and the world oil production. Can't we just replace that with natural gas then? But as you explained, it's not that simple. It's not, natural gas is not uh, a fuel, that is a liquid fuel that you can just plug into vehicle or <laughs> use in vehicles or, or burn uh, as a liquid fuel, which is, you know, what we basically need uh, for a lot of chemical industries and so on. Uh, they are used to having um, a petroleum fuel uh, to make plastics and so on. Uh, so that's, yeah. Well well, that, that, that's a good point. And, and, and I would add to that that, I mean, most of us don't think about plastics that often. But if, if, if you take, for instance, an electric car, um, the two largest components of that car are steel and plastic. And, and, and plastic has no other source other than crude oil and natural gas that we know of today in the world. If you go into a, a hospital or a clinic or even a doctor's office, look around you and what you'll see is plastic everywhere, that the medical and the healthcare industry is possibly the largest single consumer of plastic in the world. So, you know, the people who want to get off of oil, and again, I'm, I'm not criticizing them. In fact, I, I, I admire uh, their enthusiasm, but um, when 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 they go to the hospital and 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 need some sort of health care, and the plastic isn't available, then they can't get the care that they need, and they'll be very unhappy about that. So, we have to think about the bigger picture, and that you know the the oil and the natural gas, for as 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 bad as it is for emissions and for the the environment, it's also an integral part of 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 keeping human lives comfortable and, and keeping people alive. And so as we move away from or off of some of these fossil fuels, we have to be mindful of, we don't want to do that in a way that causes unnecessary suffering or even death. Um, and therefore we have to be, well, we just have to know a little bit more than, you know, uh, stop oil, you know, get rid of all these terrible oil companies. Well, you know, they may be terrible, but unfortunately every one of us um, uses their products every day of the week. And that's, that's, that's the unfortunate truth. Yeah. Finally, we've talked a lot this time as well. And, uh, but I think, I think we covered a lot as well, but, uh, if we address the question of adaption, you know, we have to adapt to this reality. Uh, we have to live on a planet uh, soon that is not uh, based on uh, economic growth because the growth part of the equation has been fossil fuels. You have the fossil fuels input into the equation. Without it, we can't have economic growth as we see it today. But let's just imagine, I think I saw an interview, I don't remember where I saw it, but I think you mentioned that, let's say we go back to the standard of living from the 50s or something, that that world, and I have heard other speakers, uh, uh, even researchers talk about this, that uh, what happens, what, maybe we could do that. How much would that save uh, in terms of energy and postponing maybe this, pre this dilemma we have right now, uh, you know, ad adapting to using less energy? Well, that's a good point. And, and, and so I think, um, I don't know what others have said, but in some of my um, the podcasts I've done with others, I, I think I've said, you know, we go back to the standard of living of the 1970s. And um, in, I mean, I mean, I grew up uh, you know, a little earlier than that, but um, I grew up in a, in a house which was uh, much smaller than the average new house today. I mean, we weren't poor, we weren't rich. Um, we had, uh, you know, two bedrooms and, and, and a work area, um, at least in the United States. I mean, most homes today have, you know, five bedrooms or, or something like that. Maybe one of them is a work area. So, so we've expanded, um, our, you know, just, just our homes and our cities have grown so much. And, uh, when I was growing up, you know, maybe every family had one car Well, you know, today, maybe they all have two or three. And so, and so the kinds of things, if we, if we go back to a different, a different period standard of living, um, 
we can have a pretty good life. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I don't remember complaining too much about <laughs> the way that my life was back in the 1960s or 1970s, but it's very different from today. And as you said, I mean, there, that, that would require a substantial, uh, adaptation, uh, by, by all of us, not, you know, not, not just, uh, people in wealthy countries, but, you know, we, we, we probably need to, reduce our energy consumption by at least 20 or 30 percent uh over the next uh two or three decades uh, just to be able to live on what we have left and, and and maybe to some people that doesn't sound like a lot to me that sounds like a a, a very large amount and so i i don't have any any expectation or even hope um that we're going to uh, choose that future. <laughs> um, but it's going to be imposed on us. It's going to be imposed on us by some co some combination of a more limited supply, a higher price for energy, which causes people to use less of it, and increasing um, environmental and ecological uh, effects of using so much energy, mostly fossil fuel, that before very long, if not already today, we're going to have to be spending a lot amount, a lot of our national budgets on 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 fixing environmental problems and dealing with unstable climates and 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 all sorts of uh, of natural disasters. So uh, I, I'm not trying to paint a you know a pessimistic or gloomy view of the future. I'm trying to describe, I think, what's already happening today. It's just that a lot of people want to ignore it and say oh well you know those are <clears throat> those are uh anomalies those are you know some sort of seasonal aberrations and maybe some of them are but but not not all of them so so my sense is is that uh whether we choose to recognize it or not in 20 years um we will be living in a very very different world with uh i'm i'm afraid to say a, a somewhat if not much lower uh, general living standard and 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 that's I, I think that's that's inevitable that's not bad um i don't think that the the human species is going to become extinct unless we go crazy with nuclear weapons or something like that which is certainly possible um you know there's all sorts of things that can happen between now and then that are bad uh i'm not suggesting that i'm just saying that i think we're going to be forced by nature by normal, by supply and by price to be using a lot less energy. And for those that are aware that that's probably what's coming and can make those changes in their personal lives, um, then uh, they'll be better off. And for those that are interested in investing, um, the more aware that you are of that, the the more you can maximize the the way you choose to invest what money that you have. I couldn't agree more. And uh, But on that note, uh... Uh, um, Art, thank you so much for a very inspiring and important discussion. Uh, I hope people um, enjoy this as much as I did. And uh, I hope we can uh, continue this conversation, maybe on other topics or continuation, update and so on in the future. Thanks. I, I enjoy talking to you, Johan, and I'm always available to discuss similar topics or, you know, maybe another time we can we can go into some of the details about, you know, where where renewables are, are really uh, helping us and, and, and where there's great potential to uh, to live better lives in some of the areas in which maybe we need to uh, change some misconceptions about about them. So uh, anytime I'm all I'm always interested in talking to you. It's always a pleasure.